So in this part, the sixth part of the series, I want to deepen a little bit the knowledge of rendering or the calculation of images. Um, it's not specifically focused on Corona, actually. It's more like a broad overview about rendering theory a little bit, and it shall give you some insight and deeper knowledge about rendering and different terms and terminology. And so it will be a bit theoretically, um, but yeah, I think it's good to know a few things when it comes to rendering and to broaden your knowledge a little bit. So rendering theory, let's start uh, way back in time. And we go back to the year 1525. And what you can see here on this image is an illustration by Albrecht Dürer. And basically this shows the first idea of a rendering or rather technology, which we refer to nowadays as ray tracing. And you can see this guy here on the right side, maybe it's Dürer himself. Um, he has this kind of frame here and in the frame there is the canvas for his image and he has another uh, supporting guy here on the left side who's holding this kind of um, thing which is attached to a string which goes back to the wall and there's a little weight here on the wall. So what happens here is basically this kind of string is something like um, a light ray or a camera ray which will go through this kind of frame here and the painter holds his finger there or the pen um, at this kind of position and this guy on the left here holds this kind of tool at a position on this kind of instrument. So then what happens is you can throw back this kind of string and close the frame and paint the point on the canvas. And if you do this on multiple points on this instrument, um, you will get this kind of image you kind of remember from maybe your kids days, where you have to connect different dots with a line and then you get the final image. So yeah, what Albrecht Dürer here does is basically to draw a 2D representation of a three-dimensional object from the perspective of this kind of anchor point here in the wall. So every light ray or every camera ray basically we shoot here through this kind of frame starts at this point and then it will kind of create the representation of the image. So quite a smart move back in the days but the same technique is actually also nowadays applied to render an image. Now, of course, this is now all done virtually and the frame you saw before, we can now imagine as a virtual image layer or the, the pixel grid we have on our screen, which will display our image. We have a virtual camera, which is positioned in our 3D editor and it will kind of shoot different rays through this kind of imaginary image layer. And what it tries to achieve is it tries to get information about the virtual scene in which we built in Cinema 4D. So it kind of shoots array from the camera through this kind of pixel grid and it looks for objects. If it finds an object in the scene, it sends information back to this kind of pixel. And in this case, for example, it tells the pixel, okay, here's an object and this object is green. So please color this pixel green. And we would do this for basically every pixel in our image and shoot uh, as many rays through our image grid as we have pixels. And then we would get finally this kind of result of our rendering. So if you would do this multiple times and we would also now improve our algorithm a little bit and we check now also if an object is in front of another object. So in this case, we have a red sphere in front of the green sphere. And we now say, okay, color this red. We kind of notice that this sphere is in front of the green sphere. And if we would do this now for every pixel, we get again the final image. Now, as you can already see, the downside of this is a little bit that it takes a bit of time to do this for every pixel. So the larger the image resolution we have is the longer the render times will actually be because we have to check every pixel 
of our image to make sure we get the right color and brightness information in there. And there are also some other drawbacks with this kind of simple technique or ray tracing technology we kind of illustrated here. Um, so we have a few things missing in this kind of images we would create. We have no light bounces. So if, for example, this kind of green sphere would shine a little bit of light to the red sphere, we have no way to calculate this because we just look at this kind of sphere and see if this sphere is red and how bright it is and give this information back to the pixel grid. We also have no information about is this object reflective? Do we see maybe another sphere in this kind of material here? Um, is this material maybe reflect refractive? So is it made out of glass? So all those information we didn't or we do not get with this kind of simple ray tracing algorithm. So we're now talking about the year 1972 and the guy named John Turner Whitted came up with a new um, implementation of the ray tracing ap approach and he called it recursive ray tracing. So not only do we now shoot a path from the virtual camera to the object, but also three more paths. So from each of those paths, we have now a new path to check if there is a shadow, is there a refraction or is there a reflection going on on our object. And this can be done recursively hundreds of thousands of times. And by this, we can actually create more realistic images. And what you, what he did was basically invent an improved illumination model for shaded display. And this is the first image he kind of rendered with this new recursive ray tracing approach and it took him uh, 74 minutes. So now if you have a look at this image, what we get here is we have now a way to see or to check if an image or an object is made out of glass, if it's refractive. We can also render shadows and we can also render reflections on our object. As you can see here, you see the checkerboard pattern is reflecting on this kind of sphere on the top. So we get a lot of nice improvements. And to understand this approach a little bit further, what we do now in comparison to the simple ray tracing is, as mentioned before, we shoot out a ray from our camera, again, like with the ray tracing, but now we shoot a second ray from this point to check, do we see a reflection from this point? And if we do see another object, we know, okay, this thing here is reflected um, at this point. And we can do this recursively, which means we also check from this point if we see another object from this. And this information will then go uh, all the way back through the camera and to our pixel grid. Then we can also check, do we see a light source from our point here? And if so, we know that there must be a shadow at the back of our object. And we can also check if this object uh, is in shadow itself, because if we don't see a light source, maybe it doesn't get any light, but if we know there's another object in between the light source and this kind of another object, we know that this part would be in shadow. And again, we do this for all other points in our scene as many times as necessary. And then last but not least, we have the third ray, which is call, um, called the refraction ray. And with this, we check if the material has a refractive um, parameter in it and if it's basically a class material or material we can see through. And if we can see it through, we kind of calculate the refraction value and we see, we look at what kind of point do we see behind the object and that uh, there, this way we get this kind of refraction from class in here. So again, we do this also for other objects and all this information goes back to our camera. As you might imagine, this is now much more intensive to calculate, but it gives us a more realistic um, result. Um, and I kind of rebuilt the scene in Corona Renderer to just see how far we have improved with the render times. And uh, back in, in the late 70s, this took about 74 minutes. And uh, now with the Corona rendering, this took about 10 seconds to get noise free. So actually, this is not done with recursive ray tracing, though. It is done with another approach, which is called path tracing.
So what's the uh, shortcomings of ray tracing in, of recursive ray tracing? We talked already about the global illumination kind of thing in our interior room where we want to have the scattered light calculated in our scene to get a very nice dis distribution of light in an interior scene, for example. So with this recurs recursive ray tracing, we don't have this kind of global illumination calculation going on. We also only can render uh, specular reflection. So we cannot render a reflection which is very diffuse, for example, from a material which is not glossy, but uh, very diffuse and very rough because we only shoot out one ray in recursive ray tracing, we can only um, yeah, basically render glossy reflections and very sharp reflections. We would need to send out even more rays uh, to get this kind of diffuse reflection, which would increase the render times even more. And then also we don't have the calculation of caustics. Caustics is basically the refraction of light and you get this kind of nice caustic patterns. You know this from, uh, for example, swimming pools in the water where you get this kind of nice effect from light breaking in different angles and accumulating at certain spots. Um, not super necessary for most cases where you uh, render an image and very intensive in render times. We can do it nowadays, but um, this is also something we couldn't do with the recursive ray tracing. Again, we would have to do and shoot multiple of those uh, refraction, refraction ray, uh, rays into our scene and thus increasing the render times even more. So we have to go a little bit further to 1986, where James Kajia kind of revolutionized the rendering scene or computational rendering scene. Um, he invented the so-called rendering equation, which is an integral equation, which kind of does all those calculations. And he invented a method which is called path tracing. So this is the first image Kajia did with the path tracing uh, algorithm. Let's have a quick look at this algorithm. Um, it looks super complicated, but it's actually a little bit simpler than, than it looks like. And you don't have to be a mathematical genius to, to understand it. Um, you don't have to understand it anyhow, but I think it's just uh, interesting to see how the calculation of the global illumination works nowadays in simple terms. So what we like to have or to achieve is we want to have a camera and we want to know how bright a certain point is in this direction of the camera or from the direction of the camera. And we want to calculate at this point all other incoming light sources. So that's why we have this kind of hemisphere here with this, which is called the Omega hemisphere. And we want to calculate, yeah, basically every incoming light from any other um, light sources in our scene. And we also want to have a specific uh, calculation of the material uh, in here to account for if this material is glossy or if it's diffuse. Um, yeah, so this is basically all this method does. It calculates the amount of light coming from a certain point from a certain direction. Um, and if we dissect this formula a little bit further, so what this term basically does is to tell us how much light goes to our camera at a certain point from a certain direction. And this part is calculating the additional emitted light if a surface is a light source. So we check if our light, if our material or our object is a light source. If so, we just add a little bit of light intensity to it. And then we have this integral, this which is basically the same thing as a for loop, if you know a little bit of programming. Um, and it checks multiple times to at this given point, what's the material material like? Um, is it diffuse? Is it glossy? Then we check all the other incoming light. We have something which is called the Lambert function. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, and we calculate the incoming um, angle direction, which goes also in this kind of formula. And yeah, this is basically it. So 
this integral just checks from multiple directions and the more directions we check the more accurate the result from this single point would be and we would do this for all the different pixels in our pixel grid and thus getting a more realistic result of our scene so talking about the lambert kind of thing here this is called the lambert cosine and you already know this when we talked about light in uh, the episode five so we take here into account if the light is coming straight into our surface or if it comes at an angle and yeah what the path tracing basically does so sorry there's a little bit of uh, wrong animation in it so what the path tracing basically does to achieve global illumination is we basically send out or check a check ray and we at this point send out multiple checks and see for example check four times uh, send out four samples to check what is the brightness of this point um, what kind of brightness do we get at this point from four different points in our room so we check this point this point this point this point and then um, sum up the brightness and see what the brightness is at this point and we send this information back to our camera now but we do this in a way that we not only sample like four points in our scene but we also send out another four rays at those points over here and then on those yellow tips we also send out another four rays and see what the intensity of light is at those other points and by doing this we get a good sampling at the end of the complete interior scene and it might not have a sample at every like spot in the room but we get a good distribution of samples if we put the sample rate high enough and therefore get a nice homogeneous distribution of light in our scene so the effect is pretty subtle but it's um, game changing because nobody came up with this kind of render equation before and the, this kind of render equation is now the way to go to solve this global illumination problem now the equation itself as you saw in in this kind of graph is very complex to calculate so it's very very you need a lot of computational power to calculate this so people came up with different methods to simplify the calculation of this kind of term in here and basically all those kind of things are stochastic uh, approximations of this kind of calculations so um, yeah we, you always get not like the complete full realistic result but we get results which are close enough to the real world and as you can see here if we compare this two images um, what we get with the path tracing is now you, you see we have global illumination here in the background we have a brighter distribution of light we have light bouncing back from this kind of sphere back to the ground we have maybe a little bit more diffuse shadow um, and we also have here a better brightness or brightness distribution from the light source on our object so as you can see very subtle differences compared to the standard ray tracing or recursive ray tracing method um, but still game changing and it's the um, solution which we use nowadays and to come back here very shortly uh, in our corona scene what you find here under the gi solver those are basically the methods or the algorithms we can use to calculate this kind of rendering equation and as you can see here we find the ray tra the path tracing again so this method is a little bit slower um, as the uhd cache but it's a bit more accurate and then we have this kind of experimental 4k cache so we don't have to necessarily necessarily understand now what each of those methods does the uhd cache is fine in most of the cases but just that you understand this kind of global illumination solver all this thing does is to calculate the render equation so that we get a nice photorealistic light distribution in our scene and in the next part we will talk a little bit about the differences here between what is called the biased and unbiased render engines.